Okay, welcome to Unix Systems. I am Nachum Danzig. I'm lecturing at Merkaz Academy Leiv, and we are going to start our course on Unix systems, on how they work, on using them, um, features of them, and various other things. Okay, so let's start here. What is Unix? That's always a good place to start. It's an operating system originally for a PDP-7, also for a PDP-10. Um, it was developed at Bell, or PDP-11 even. PD, it was developed at, at which are, these are big mainframe computers, developed at Bell Labs in 1969 by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Um, yeah, Dennis Ritchie also was involved mm -hmm. in creating the C language, along with Brian Kernigan and they that language was purposely written for the Unix operating system. Originally, the Unix op operating system was written in assembly, and Ken Thompson basically realized that he couldn't keep we couldn't write a complicated system in assembly, and they they started to use a language called B, and it didn't work so well either, and then they used something called new B, and eventually something called C when it had structures. And that was the moment that it actually became easier to write the operating system in C, they added structures to C. Um, so C and C++ eventually, you know, which eventually became C++, C was written for the purpose of writing the Unix operating system uh, way back. Unix operating system is still in use today, it's extremely popular, but more in use is Linux, which is a 1991 port of Unix for a PC. Remember, Unix was originally written for a mainframe PDP-7 and not for a PC. So for his, uh, I think, undergraduate thesis, Linus Travel wrote a port for Unix for a PC. In other words, he wrote an operating system that behaved like Unix. He wrote an operating system that behaved like Unix, but to run on a different hardware, to run on the PC hardware, which was very popular in 1991. Uh, it had been already. And we still use Linux today. It's very popular for servers um, and even for workstations. Okay, why to learn Unix? Why to use Unix? Um, so Unix is a well-organized operating system. It's easy to use, it's stable, it's scalable. Scalable means that if I add more memory, it'll run faster. If I, if I, as I add resources, it will, it will actually improve. Um, it is safe. Safe means that my files can't be accessed by your files unless I let you. Um, this is true for most modern operating systems. And it's still widely in use. Linux is using Unix type system. Mac OS is, uni is using a uh, Unix system. iOS and Android are similar, are also based on Unix. So it's still very much in use. And if you under, and furthermore, if you understand Unix, what it, what services it provides, you'll understand the services that other powerful operating systems provide. In other words, they all have by now copied all the features that Unix provides. Um, so therefore, if you learn Unix, it's not, you'll learn the concepts for all the other operating systems that you may encounter, at least the serious operating systems. And the other big advantage of Unix is that it's open source, which means you can actually modify the kernel if you want. You, the kernel is the, the essence of the operating system. You can get the open source, not the compiled, Windows, you can only get the compiled version. You can't compile your own, you can't compile it yourself. But here, which means you can't change it. But here in Unix, you can get the open source version, change it, and you can create your own version of the operating system. You can modify it, which makes it uh, friendly for people who are um, skilled and are interested in modifying the operating system. How do I communicate with the Unix system? So, just a second. 
you use something called, you can either use what's called a, 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 a CLI, a command line interface, or a GUI, or a GUI, a, GUI, a graphical user interface. A lot of what we're going to do in this course is, is um, use the command line interface because the command line interface uh, is more standard across systems. And sometimes you have a system that you're accessing remotely and it doesn't allow for a graphical user interface. So if you learn the command line interface, which essentially is harder to use, then you certainly can do the graphical user interface. Um, whatever type of command, whatever we type on the command line is executed by the shell. The shell is also an interpreter. So the shell is a program that runs to mediate between the user and the operating system. I ask the shell to do something. It tries to do it. It sees if it's possible to do it and runs it and gives me messages whether it succeeded or not. So the shell is like how I communicate, how I use the operating system. It's also an interpreter for a language called shell. Or in our course, what we'll learn is a sh particular shell called bash. It's like a particular language. Um, you can run multiple commands from a file. So let me demonstrate this because I'm talking a little bit in the air. Uh, let me stop the share and share on my entire screen. Or, yeah, actually, wait a second. First, I'll. Cancel that just a second. Uh, here and now. Share. Here. Here is what I'm talking about the command line interface for a Linux operating system. Again, Linux is a version of Unix, so it's totally legitimate to learn on a Linux machine, even though the course is called Linux. Of course, it's called, called Unix. So I can do commands, like, for example, I can type gibberish. And the shell will say, gibberish, command not found. It couldn't find that command, because there is no command like that. But I can, and notice it returned a new line, this green line that says my name and laptop and all this stuff until a dollar sign, that is called the prompt. Every time I do a command, it returns a prompt to tell me that it finished. <clears throat> now I type DSF and it says, maybe you meant one of these things It's trying to help me. Um, but if I type, for example, LS, that is a real command, it will list for me, LS stands for list, it will list for me the direct, the files, that are in the directory in which I am situated. What directory am I situated in? I can type pwd, present working directory, and it will tell me that I'm in home slash, slash home slash Danzig. So there is a tree of the file structure, and in the top of the tree is slash, it's called slash, and in that directory is a directory called home. By the way, we call Directories, you might be familiar with another name, which is folder. That's what Windows calls it, but we call it in Unix a directory. So in the directory home, I have a directory called Danzig. So for example, if I, I can actually do, so ls lists for me the files. I can also do ls minus l. It will list for me in l long form the files. So I have the same file names here, but I have more information about them. I'll explain what this information is later. But for now, you can see that these are the these are timestamps or date stamps. March second, twelve p.m. and thirty three minutes, and that's the time that I last modified this file called index.html. So these are uh, a couple of commands that the shell can interpret. Let's go back. So that's what you understand by a prompt and by a shell. Let's go back to the slides. Use shell on Windows? Excuse me? Can you use shell on Windows system? 
shell. Uh, no, yeah. shell is a Unix thing. There is something called PowerShell in Windows, which they uh, adopted from Windows, from, from Unix. So there is a kind of PowerShell in Windows, but it's not the same. I mean, it's very similar, but it's not the same. But I'm running Linux on top of my Windows machine, which I will, I have a video to explain how to do that already in Moodle uh, on YouTube. So that's how I communicate with the Unix system. If your command fails, you'll see an error message. When the shell finishes, you'll see a prompt. Well, we saw that. How does the shell find its command? When you give the, the when you give a command to the shell, it assumes you are specifying a program to run. So it obviously will search for that program on the system with the name that you have specified, and then it'll run it. It's also possible that the shell that the command is something that the shell itself is programmed to do without having to run a separate program. For example. Well, some commands, the shell, himself, the shell itself runs. It doesn't look for a program to run. If the shell can't find your command, it will print command not found. You probably misspelled the command. So we saw that. When I type gibberish, it type command not found. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how the shell finds your program. So does the shell search all for all commands? So in Unix, we have these directories. Searching every directory would be slow. So we have what's called a path, which is spelled in capital letters, which lists which directories to look in for the command. Remember, the command is just a program name. So I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Um, let me let me do it right now. I'll show you. Stop share. Screen share. Why did this window die? Okay. So, for example, I have a command called echo, which just prints whatever I tell it to print. So, if I tell it to print hello, it'll print hello. If I tell it to print hello world, it'll print hello world. That's what echo does. I can also give echo a variable name. Variables start with dollars, similar to the way they do in assembly. So dollar path. Path, again, as I said, is a variable that stores all the places to look for a program. So for example, it's gonna look in directory user local spin. Then there's a colon. So that's the a colon indicates the end of the first directory to look. Then it'll look in user local bin. Eventually it'll look in user bin. Eventually it'll look at slash bin. So if we go, for example, cd slash user slash bin, cd, uh, so cd is change directory. If I do change directory, I'm now no longer where I was in, in home Danzig. I'm now, if I type pwd, I see that I'm in slash. I did cd to slash, the very top. And if I do ls from here, I will see all these directories. Now, the directories are in blue. And they have a D. If you notice the D in the front, D stands for directory. So these ones are not directory. They start with an L. There's something else. But these are directories. And you notice that here there's a directory called user or USR. There should also be a directory called, well, there could be a directory called bin, but there isn't. Um, well, here, bin. Bin is a pointer to user bin. So that means I can, if I go to cd slash user slash bin, and now I do ls, I'll see lots of names of programs. For example, I might see if I do ls, um, ls, I see that there's a program called ls in this directory ls minus l ls that's the name of the program ls it's owned by root which is the super user there are other programs here for example 
ls echo. Echo is here. So there's a this directory, user bin, is basically full of binary files. That's why it's called bin. Bin is short for binary. Binary means compile files, means programs written in C that were then compiled and are now executable. I can run them. Executing means running them. So when I type, for example, echo, he's going to run the the shell will find echo in this directory and run it. So every small command that you do is essentially a program. Yes, every command is a program. Well, that's what I said, except there are some commands that the shell itself knows how to do. And it doesn't run a program. The main one being exactly. CD itself. CD is not a command. If I do LS minus L, CD, no such file or directory here. There is no CD command. It's part of the shell. It was written into the software of the shell. But the other commands, it just looks for them in this directory or in other directories. Has, does that mean it has like echo in every single directory? No, it looks for it. In It knows where to look for it. Oh, so even if you're in bin, let's say, and you use echo, it will use it by using it from the other directory. Exactly. It will find where it is and run it from where I am, it'll run that directory wherever it really is. How does it do that? Because essentially what it does is like this. It types, if I'm at home, let's say I'm at home, CD without any parameters takes me to my home directory. So if I type slash user binary echo, hello, it, it's the same thing as if I just wrote echo. If I write, if I make a mistake and I write like an E over here, no such file, it doesn't find it. There is no such thing. If I just give it nothing, if I give it, the, if I give it the full path, this is called the full path. If I tell it where echo is, it'll run echo. If I type, and it, because if I give it the right path, well, there I give it the wrong path. Here, if I give it the right path, it'll run it. If I don't give it a path then it will look for the path and append it pre or prepend it to the, it'll prepend user bin to this echo. And then it's as though I gave it the path. So that's how, what the shell's job is. How does it do that? It looks in the path. It, it takes this variable dollar path and it, tries out, it goes like this. It says, let me take this first part. No. Uh, no. Sorry. It takes this first part, I'm having trouble cutting and pasting because I don't have a proper mouse, but it will, let's say it'll do like this. I'll just type user local S bin. It tries the first one, echo, hello. And it says, I can't find echo there. No such file directory in this directory, which is a real directory. It doesn't find a, a, a file called echo because it's not there. So it actually, the shell, the, the shell is not smart. It just tries the first place and sees if echo's there. If, it's, if it gets a no response, then it, I mean, if, if it finds that it's not there, it will try the next location and the next until it hits upon one where it is there, like user bin. And then it will run it. This has a very important implication. It means that if I have, for example, echo in two locations, I have it in user bin and also in user local S bin, only one of them will get run. Which one will get run? The first one, the one in S bin, because it tries them out in the order of the path. So the path actually tells the shell, what is the order I want to run things in? 
Now, um, just a second. No, it doesn't do anything. Um, All right. Um, oh, let's try this one. Just change a second. Okay. So H1, you see this little file here? H1 is a file which writes hello to the screen. It's a program. It's actually a program that runs, writes hello to the screen. If I just type H1, it won't run. Command not found because it looks in the path for every place that's there and doesn't find it. And it doesn't even bother to look in the local in where I am, so even though I'm sitting right here, it doesn't look right here. In order to get it to run H1, I have to type dot, which means right here in my directory, underneath my directory, dot slash. In other words, in the current directory, right, run the program H1. Then it will work. I need to tell it where it is because I could also write, for example, slash home, maybe this is more obvious, slash home, slash Danzig, slash H1. Now it will run this program because I told it where to look. The shell doesn't know to look in the current directory because the path does not have the current directory in its definition, echo, Let's just prove that again. Echo, echo, dollar path. There is no mention of user of of the of of home Danzig here, so it doesn't know it to goes, look at home Danzig. It goes to every path by its own. It goes to every path that's written here. That's the right way to say it. it goes to every path that is written in this list. The list is a colon separated list of directories and i don't see in here home dancing but no never where, where you created this list from where this list comes come uh from this there is a variable it's called a environment variable defined when i log in called path and that the value of that variable is a long string this is the long string that it has i can print the variable and there's another environment variable echo dollar home that is another variable which has the string of where my home directory is there these are called environment variables they're variables that i inherit that i get when i log in so the path it becomes very useful i can modify it i can modify it like this now here I write without a dollar. Path equals no space dollar path here. That's just to tell it dollar path. I want it to be the same as dollar plus, but I want to add to it colon slash home Danzig. Now when I echo in other words, the path is equal to whatever the path was. Dollar is the way I, when I define a path, a path, I, when I define any variable, I do not write a dollar. But when I refer to it, when I use it, I need the dollar. I use the, bra the, the, parent, the brackets to indicate the end of the, of, the, of the variable name so that I know that the colon is not part of the variable name. The truth is in this example, I didn't need the parentheses, the brackets or the braces. I didn't need the braces because the colon cannot be part of a variable name. So it would know anyway the variable name ended there. But just to be safe, I wrote it with parent with the braces. And then I, I said that it should equal whatever this string is, plus, you know, and just keep writing this after that. So now when I do echo path, I see that at the end I have home dancing. Now when I try to write H1, 
without the dot slash before it, it runs it because it found it in the path. So I can define the path, I can change the path to include my home directory. Let's go back to my slides. So we define a path, we list the directories to look for the command. Remember, the command is just a program name. If I have two different directories in the path and the program, if I have two different directories in the path, now what if two different directories in the path have programs with the same name? So we discussed that. Which one will be executed? The first come, first serve. The first one it reaches, it will be... Uh, run. It depends on the order of the directories in my path. I can rearrange my path so that the order is different, and then perhaps different programs will get run before, you know, because they are first. Okay, now we have, we talked about commands. We saw commands like ls, which lists. Now, we're going to talk about now the general structure of any command in the shell. It has a general structure of command name, flag, operand. Very important to understand this concept. So in my case, I wrote ls was the command, minus l was a flag. Notice a minus sign. And then the operand, I had no operand. So ls works without any operand. But when I have these dots here, it means I can have multiple flags, and dots here means I can have multiple operands. So for example, here's a case of ls, my directory. I'm listing the content of my directory. No flag, but yes, I do have an operand. Here, I did a different command. Now, this arrow indicates that it's a new prompt, a new line. Here, I did ls minus l. This is the command, flag, operand. Without even knowing what this command is, I can tell that this is command, operand, operand. There's no flag because there's no minus. So this is ls. ls can also run without any flag or operand, as we saw. So now that you understand ls, let's learn some more commands. There's a command rm. Oh, rm wait. is- What ls as a command, what exactly does it do? Well, we use it, it lists. It lists the okay. content of a directory. It can also list files. Just shows me information. It either if I just do it else without an L, it just shows me the names of the files. If I do it with an L, it gives me more information about the files, like when it was last modified. Who's the owner of the file? There's a, there's a set amount of flags. Yes, I'll show you here. Let's. And this is uh, and minus L is a flag specific for LS. That's right. The flags are not necessarily interchangeable. You have to know which flag goes for which command. So for example, here I am again, and I do ls minus l, and it lists for me the directories in the current directory, the, the files and directories in the current directory. Now I can also do ls minus l and give it a bunch of file names. What happened now is I listed two files. I said ls minus l, so l is for long format. So it gives me more details. File name, file name. And it listed for me both of them. It told me that they're owned by Danzig. It told me their last modified date. It told me the number of bytes in each file, 63 and 62, and some other information. Now, there are other commands. For example, well, there's a command touch. 
touch create changes the modified date of an existing file or creates a file if it does not exist. So if I would say, for example, touch a stam, now all of a sudden there's a directory, there's a file called stam whose creation date is March 4th, 535. And it has zero bytes in it. Now, if I don't want that file, I can do rm remove file, stam. Now, when I do ls, I see that the file is not there. No garbage, no um, recycle bin, no trash can, it's gone. No way to recover. Stam a folder or is it just- It was a file. file. When I create something with touch, it creates a file. If I want to create a folder, I do mkdir, make directory. And I can do stam. Now, if I do rm stam, well, first of all, let's see that it's there, ls minus l. We see that stam is there, and this time there's a D at the front, indicating a directory. Which now flag is the minus L? Long form. If you want to know all the flags, what you can do is you can type man for manual LS. And then you can scroll through using the space bar all the flags, minus A, minus B, Minus C, minus D, what they do, all the flags, what they do. Minus H, minus L, K, A, A, almost every letter of the alphabet is here. Lots of flags. By the way, this means reverse the order while sorting. Now, minus R is one way to write it. I can also do minus, minus, and write out the whole word reverse. They're equivalent ways of doing the same thing. Capital R is recursive. Now, <clears throat> how are you supposed to remember that? Well, you don't have to remember it. You can write it out. You can write minus, minus recursive, and then you'll for sure do recursive. Recursive means list subdirectories. In other words, don't just list the names of every directory in the current directory. List recursively. Go into each directory and list its names, and then its directories and list its name forever until you reach the bottom. So you can imagine that if I would do ls minus, even though I'm here, by the way, look, I'm here, I'm in my home directory. I can still do ls on a different directory. ls minus l r on slash. That's the top of the tree of files. So that's going to list me lots of stuff. Every single file that's there. So I'm going to do control C and stop that in the middle. Um, I was in the middle of creating a directory and it was called stam. Now, if I want to delete the directory, I don't, if I try rm stam, it will say cannot remove stam, it is a directory. So I have a special command for deleting it, rm dir, remove directory, stam. Now I deleted it. If I recreate the directory, <clears throat> mk dear stam, and now I put something in it, for example, touch stam slash stam. Now inside of stam, there's a file called stam. If I do like this ls minus l stam, I see that it says total zero, but it says there's a direct, this is now a file called stam, which is inside of a directory called stam. I do, now if I try to do rm dir on stam, it will no longer work. Fail to remove stam, directory is not empty. I can only remove a directory after first removing all of the contents from the directory. Since there's something in the directory, I cannot remove this directory. There is a way around this. You can do rm, even though rm normally only removes files and not directories, if I use the minus r flag for recursive, here it's a lowercase r for recursive, I <clears throat> can now remove stam and it will go inside first, delete the contents of the directory and only then remove the directory. So now it succeeded, it, by the way, in, in Hebrew they say shtikak v'hodadam, that, that Quietness means that you succeeded. It's it 
I, I didn't get any reaction. It must mean it worked. Didn't tell me an error message. So if I type now uh, ls minus l, I'll see there's no directory called stop. Okay, now let's go back to cd. cd, without any parameters, takes me to my home directory. cd, I can give it a path. And now I'm in bin. Notice that it writes bin over here to tell me where I am, uh, which is nice. Now I want to go back home. I can just type cd without any parameters, and I'm back home. PWD tells me my present working directory is home, is home dancing. So cd without any parameters takes me home. If I do cd slash bin again, and I do cd tilde, it's the equivalent. I also am back home again. Two different ways to get back home. I can Now I can also go, let's say I want to go to home. There's two ways I can go to home. I can type cd slash home. And now I'm in slash home. As you can see here, it writes for me slash home. That obviously will work. If I go back home to home dancing, I can also go up one directory. Essentially, I want to go to home, which is one directory above dancing. So there's a special way of doing that, cd dot dot. cd dot dot means go up one directory. So now I'm also in home. Home is the... Um, is home the is just room? a directory name. What is in home? Only me. If there would be more users on this machine, then there might be home Cohen, home Smith, home Brown. All the uh, automatically by, by, you know, the nature, the normal way to work in Ubuntu, in this version of Linux, is to have the user home directories in a Underneath the home direct, underneath the directory called home. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's the way it is on this system. Okay, questions so far? So let's learn some other commands here. RM, we saw copy, CP is copy. My file, copy of my file. In other words, I create an, a, a, an identical copy of this file by writing CP on the ex first existing, then new. In other words, this is the existing file, my file. This is the new file. CD we talked about. CD with my directory without a slash will just take me to um, a directory called my directory underneath my current directory. CD without any parameters takes me home, just like CD tilde does. Okay. So this we kind of talked about. Uh, every directory can contain subdirectories. The top directory is called slash or called root. It's designated by a slash. Um, when I do ls, it lists files, but actually everything is considered like a file. So a directory is a file, it's a kind of a file. Links to other files. I can have what you call in Windows shortcuts. We call in, in Linux, we call links. It's a link. So a link is also a kind of file. It's just a link. It's a file that points to another file. Even devices or special files are files. What is devices? It means like the mouse or the keyboard or the screen is actually can be viewed of as a, um, as a file. Also something called name pipes and sockets, which we're not going to talk about now, are also like pipes, are, are also like files and will be listed by ls. Here is a basic home, you know, part of the graph, part of the directory structure of Linux. It has a graphical Kilo kind of graphical representation. But what it's saying is like this, inside of slash, we have all these home, all these directories. We have home, like we saw, we have user, like we saw, we have bin, we have sbin. Inside of bin, for example, we have things like CP, like we saw other programs like uname and bash. Inside of user, we may have a directory called bin or a directory called lib, which is short for library, and another directory called sbin more binary files. In dev, we usually have what are called devices, like 
SDA and SDA1 would be the hard drive. And TTY would be the screen. Okay. Now, we some of these things we've already done. CD can take you to a direct, to a, to a direct path. You can also, now when I run LS, I can give it the full path if I want. Remember, we did that. Um, and then I can do it on a full path of a home directory. This is called an absolute path. And there's, whenever I start from the top slash and I tell you exactly where I want you to go from the top, that's called an absolute path. So I can give the absolute path for LS, the absolute path for my home directory and list everything in my home directory. Obviously, this is on a different system where my home directory was not in home dancing, but it was in user U home dancing. Now I can also have a relative path. For example, I can say starting from wherever I am, go somewhere. So if I write like this, CD home work, Unix, that means starting where I am, go down into homework and then down into Unix. If I do dot dot, I go up. This means go up and then go up again. And then from wherever you are there, go down into HTML, assuming because it'll be, I, I know it's there. Otherwise I wouldn't have written this. So up, up, and then there you'll find a directory called HTML, go into that. And there you'll find a directory called dancing, go into that. So I can, I can go up and down in one step. I can also refer to LS like that. I can say, if I happen to know that, if I'm in, let's say user, been, or I, I don't know, I'm in some place, I can say, go up twice and where you are, you'll find bin and then that you'll find LS and run LS from there. That's called a relative path because it's relative to my location. <clears throat> so now we're going through some commands. I showed you how to use these, some of these commands. CP we saw, RM we saw, move is also another useful command. It moves something. I should show you how to use move because it's a little bit weird how it works. For moving uh, files from one place to another. That's one of its functions. Yes, it moves files. Just a second. Does it work on uh, folders also or directories? Yes, you can move a whole directory. Mm -hmm. oh. Something wrong with my sharing. It's not letting me share the way I want to. Just a second. There it is. So share. Okay. Okay, so I want to show you move. So for example, I have a file called, if I do like this, text dot t -E -X, no, t -X -T one if I do move that, move that, to cuckoo. Ah, I'm in the wrong directory. See, it says no such directory because look where I am, I'm in home. So CD should take me to my real home directory. By the way, this little tilde there means you're in your home directory. So now my move should work. And if I do LS minus L, I see that there's something called cuckoo and the file called text.txt1 is no longer there. I moved it. So it's actually like renaming it in that case. But there's other thing I can do. For example, notice notices a directory called C over here. If I do move cuckoo to C, what will it do? Will it rename cuckoo C? like I just did when I renamed text cuckoo? No, because it'll understand that since C exists and C is a directory, to move it there. 
So now when I do ls minus l, I do not see cuckoo. But when I do ls minus l on the directory c, I see that there's cuckoo there. So I moved it. That's, that's why it's called move, because I really moved it. I moved it into that directory. The only thing is, if I move it to the same directory, but then I change the name of it. Now, if I go like this, now if I go to CDC, so I'm in this directory and I have cuckoo and stom. What's gonna happen if I do move stom cuckoo? What, what do you think is gonna happen? An uh, error. Where is it moving it to? Wait, let me do it again. Let me do it the other way around. Uh, move cuckoo stom. Notice the size. Stom is zero. Zero bytes. Cuckoo is 62 bytes. If I move cuckoo to stom, you might think it's an error, but it's not an error. What it's going to do, it's going to rename cuckoo stom. But stom already exists. So it might ask me, do you want to override? So if I do like this, minus I is interactive. It will ask me, overwrite? And then I'm going to say no. So now if I do ls, I'll still see both of them there. But if I don't, if I forget to write the minus flag, the minus I flag, it just overwrites. It doesn't ask any questions. And now when I go look, there's a thing called STOM, but what's its size? 62. It's actually what was Cuckoo. So I renamed Cuckoo to STOM, even though STOM existed, I overwrote STOM. But if STOM were a directory, then it would move it into the directory so move has a complicated kind of behavior, but it all makes sense because if you're moving to a directory, so you're moving into the directory. If you're moving to a file, so then you're obviously deleting the file. That's what it means to move to the file. You are in the Does file. Does it matter so, that uh, the original uh, uh, STOM was zero bits? No, could have been. It could have been the other way around. I just did it that it way. It doesn't matter. Sure. So as long as there's a, if you're moving it into something that already exists, then it will override it or it will not, depending on what you decide. It'll try if to I, copy it. I don't know. It will, it will, if you move it to something that exists, that is a file, it will overwrite it. Unless you wrote the minus I flag, in which case it will ask you first. Is that clear? So we have move, we saw R and minus R is recursive. If I would do on um, star, I would remove everything because star is like a wild card. So if I did R and minus R star, I might remove things. Sometimes the uh, RM is, sometimes ver some versions of RM automatically ask you before removing something, do you want to remove this? If I give it the minus F flag, it will never ask me. It will just delete things. For F stands for force. Force the deletion. LN stands for create a link. <clears throat> so we should talk about that. And for example, I'm in this directory C. If I do LN minus symbolic, now I'm creating a symbolic link to, well, all I have here is STOM. So you always start with the real thing, STOM. You might think to write the other way around, but STOM, and then I want to create something called, um, you know, sh short cut to stop. So now if I do ls minus l, I see that I have a shortcut to stop, which is pointing to stop. Notice that it has an l at the beginning. That means it's a link. This is not a link. This is the real file. Now, if I do something like, um, if I cat, cat is prints the file. So I do cat shortcut, I'm going to see contents of stam because it's really point it's really pointing to that one even though it's more than four it says four bytes here 
It's obviously more than four bytes. It's many bytes. It's 62 bytes. Well, the link isn't 62 bytes. But it points to that. Now, if I change stam, now one way to change it, we said that we can do echo, hello. And I can do echo, hello, and then I can append it with the two arrows. That means like append it into another file. And I can append it into shortcut to stam. Now, if we do ls minus l, we'll see it's no longer 62 bytes, it's 68 bytes. I added six bytes to it. But where did I do it to? I did it to shortcut. What did I do? I did it to shortcut. But STOM itself got bigger because it's a link. I'm really editing STOM. Now, if I do like this, RM STOM, and now I do cat shortcut to STOM, what do you think I'm going to get? What do you think I'll get? Hello? Hello, oh, um... No, I'm not sure. Well, cat prints the content of the file shortcut. What's the content of the child shortcut? Shortcut? Well, it points to STOM. Does STOM exist? Um... Mm. No. no. No, I did RM on stop. <laughs> no such file directory. But wait a second. Shortcut exists. What do you mean no such file directory? What it means is the thing, it doesn't know about shortcut. It would even like write shortcut. It's as though I wrote stop. It's because it's a pointer to stop. So it's giving me that message because it didn't find stop. It comes up in red in my version of Ubuntu because it's telling me it's a broken link. Now, if I recreate STOM like this, echo, hello. Wait, can anybody, I can't see the, the terminal. Can, any, can everybody else? Yeah, I can see everything. I can see the bottom. And I think it's just frozen. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's... You can't see, then you're in trouble here. You see now? Anyway, I do LS minus LRT, and I see STOM is now exists. It's four bytes long. Let's see what I get. Why is it only four bytes long? That's weird. So cat. Notice it's no longer blue. It's no longer uh, red because it exists. Hello. Oh, it's six bytes long. I don't know. It's a, oh, I was looking at the wrong place. It's the date is four. Here it's six bytes. Um, so it's six bytes long. Hello. So I can recreate, I don't, the, the shortcut is no longer a broken shortcut because the thing that it's pointing to, I recreated. I, I recreated something called STOM, even though it's a different file, but it has the same name, the shortcut now works. And that's one kind of shortcut. Let's look at another kind of shortcut or another kind of link. Um, what did I want to do? Yeah, so let's say like this, link. Not minus symbolic. I don't write minus L. Not a, a real link. Link. Stom. Stom the real thing that exists. And a new one, I'll call it Stom 1. Now, LS minus L. Now, notice that Stom 1 is six bytes. It's not like a link that's only four bytes. It's the same size as Stom 1. If I do echo hello. Let's say hello one. If I do that to stom one, let's see what happens. Stom one and stom are now both 13 bytes, but I only put it into stom one. Why did stom two? Why did stom? I put it into the link, it went into the original. It seems they're both getting bigger at together. If I would delete stuff from one, I would delete from the other two. So these are also linked together because what I do to one affects the other. But there's a difference. Let's see the difference. The original one was STOM, if you remember, and STOM one was the copy. Let's remove STOM. 
The original is gone. Let's do L as minus L. So the broken link is coming up in red, but STAM1 is not. And it still says 13. If I do cat STAM1, I see it's still there. So what you see here is that it's a, a that this kind of link is a weird kind of link. You don't, I don't know if you have this in Windows, but this is a link where each one is just as much the real one as the other. Doesn't matter which one I delete first, they, whichever one is still around will still have the contents. It does this in a complicated, it, well, I, I don't know if I should explain how it works, but it um, essentially, what it does is it, it has a register of the inode, it's something called an inode, which uh, stands for the file. And when I create a, a hard link, a regular link, it adds a number to the file. And it says there's actually two instances of the file. And both of these file names point to the same hard I inode. And when I delete one of them, the other one is still pointing to that same inode but the number next to the inode goes down as I delete them. And once the number goes to zero, it deletes the inode. That's a short explanation of how that works. Um, anyway, the point is that a hard link, I can delete either one. So it sounds like, it, the only thing you might say is, well, wait a second, but a hard link seems wasteful because I'm recording all the data twice. So the answer is no. It's just one inode that has those 13 bytes in it. And both of these are pointing to it. So they're not actually, that's how it's able to change one by changing the other. And you're not actually wasting any space. So I hope you understand the difference between hard link and soft link. Um, that's a somewhat complicated thing, but it's a good thing to understand. We saw already RMDIR, remove directory, and mkdir create an empty directory. There's another command which is useful, apropos. Apropos, you know, I can do apropos file. And it'll tell me every command that has something to do with file. Apropos means something to do with. So I can do apropos, maybe that's a bad example. Apropos um, process. Again, so you see a lot of commands that deal with processes. Top, display Linux processes. So I can type top, so and it shows me some processes that are running. So apropos is a good way for finding something, finding a command to deal with a topic or subject you want. If I do apropos uh, mkdir, it's going to find me mkdir. That's about the only thing. It also finds me something else, mkdir at. I don't know what that is. Um, OK. So there's Just another you, yeah. also, question. You get the flags using uh, apropos also? No. To get the flags, you use something called man. Man mkdir. So it tells me the flags for the command mkdir. Man is short for manual page. I get out of these manual pages by typing Q. So I'm now out of it. That's man. There's also a command called touch. We saw that. Touch creates a file. Um, if the file exists, it just updates the edit time. So I think I created it. I don't think it existed. Uh, Wait a second. Okay, so wait, let me do some more commands. Oh, I see. Okay, so 
let's do we saw i don't know if we saw a cat cat shows me the content of a file so i can do for example cat stom one and it shows me hello hello one if i do cat it also concatenates i can give it two file names so if i example do cat stom one and stom it will print the kind of both files. It just so happens that STOM has nothing in it, so it's not so interesting. I could theoretically give it the same file twice, STOM1, and it'll print one and then the next. So cat actually can take as many operands as I want, and it just prints the content of the file. That's why it's called concatenate, because I can do something like this, cat those things, and then redirect it to a file called STOM. And now, if I do cat, Stom, I'll see that the things that I notice that cat did not print out anything. Instead of printing it out, it redirected it into the file stom. And now stom has in it the pro the, the what I printed out. So in a sense, cat did something called concatenation. If I look at my home directory, I see that stom, in fact, is 26 bytes long, twice the size of stom one, because I put stom one in it twice. So this is it. creating a new file uh, file in STOM. I create well, like actually, the style in STOM existed. I just added to it. I could create a you new file. Stuff I could create a file called Cuckoo, which does not exist. And now we'll see that Cuckoo is exactly the same size as STOM because I put in it STOM one twice. Now let's make a new file. Or let what, what do we see is in it? Hello one, hello hello one. So let's add some stuff to the file. Let's say like this, um, echo zebra into, all right, into cuckoo. And let's do the echo apple. Now we'll do cat cuckoo. And I see, hello, 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 zebra apple. Well, that's the file. Now, what if I want to sort this file? So I have a special function called sort. So I can do sort. Cuckoo. And it doesn't change the file. It just prints out the file in order. Apple first, then hello. Notice the two hellos are for together because they're in the same. After them comes with a hello one. And at the end comes zebra. So I can concatenate, I can sort. Now, what if I won't want hello to be there twice? So okay. I can, what? Is there a remove command? So there's a program called unique. What unique does, I pipe, this is called a pipe. I pipe the output of this command. Instead of to the screen, I send it into unique. And unique, prints me only the ones that are unique. So it removed the two hellos. Cuckoo, of course, it just printed out to the screen. Cuckoo is actually still the way it was. Cuckoo is unsorted. Cat, cuckoo, it's unsorted and ununique. Now, if I would do this in reverse order, let's try doing this in reverse order. Unique, oh, sorry. Unique cuckoo, and then pipe it through sort. So look what it did. It it sorted it apple, but it didn't make it unique. Why not? The unique didn't do anything because the way unique works is it checks the file. It checks here's the file the way it is. Hello, hello one. It checks, are these two the same? No. Then it checks, are these two the same? No. Are these two the same? No. It checks if the adjacent ones are the same. Since they're not, unique will not work. Unique doesn't go through the whole file and look and, and, and remember everything. It just checks the two adjacent. But if I sort the file first, now when I sort it, that automatically puts adjacent, identical things to be adjacent. Once they're identical, and adjacent, now sort, now unique will work. Because it's comparing hello to hello and seeing they're the same, so it removes one of them. 
And then it prepares hello one hello one. It removes one. So this this is called pipelining, and pipelining is a major feature of Unix. Uh, the inventor of Unix was very. That was when he felt the machine was actually a. The, the, the operating system was actually a useful thing that it can do this pipelining. And actually, this allows for us to create, to do all kinds of creative things with files based on using these what we might call modular filters. We call these filters because basically they're filtering the text. The text are passing the text of a file through a filter and getting a certain new text. So by combining these filters, I can create all kinds of things. There's another command called word count. Word count is tells me the number of words, lines, and bytes in a file. So for example, if I do word count cuckoo, it tells me that cuckoo has 38 characters, six lines, six words, and six lines. First lines. Six lines, six words, because it gets smaller. Lines, then little words. Words are delineated by spaces. So since each word is on its own line, it's the same number of words and spaces. And characters. Now, I can combine all these things. I can say, sort it, unique it, and then don't print out that unique, just pass that unique thing into word count. And I will see that Why is it doing that? Wait a second. Admit. Is it supposed to just display one digit? Whatever. Or... So now it's going to tell me four. Why four? Because four is how many lines I have. One, two, three, four. After it passed through the filters, I filtered it down. I first I sorted it. Then I uniqued it. That removed two lines. So now word count is going to tell me the, the word count of the result of this. So if I wanted to know, please tell me how many unique entries are in this file unique lines are in this file, this would be the way to do it. So I can create all kinds of questions, all kinds of, I can solve all kinds of uh, problems that I want to solve as far as evaluating files used by combining uh, very small programs in various ways. That's one of the powers of this uh, operating system. So I'll show you a couple more things. Uh, we have we have a command more. More essentially lets me go through a file. So if I have a long file, um, well wait a second. Let's see. Where is is a command, where is words? Let me find it. Oh. Um, well, more, I can't really, if I do man on, let's say, ls. So I'm actually running it. This is a page. This is actually a file. And I'm actually running a program called called more, which is letting me scroll through the file. Every time I press a page, it gives me a new file. It gives me more of the file. And then when I get to the end, I have to do Q to quit. So, but I can actually type more cuckoo. Now, since cuckoo is a short file, more doesn't do much. It just looks like cat because it's only a small file. It doesn't have many pages. That's why it was hard for me to give you an example. With I don't have a large file right here. But I can now also do things like this. Uh, the first of all, there's another command called less, which is exactly the same as cuckoo, because everyone knows that less is more. Well, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Less cuckoo. Oh, it's not exactly the same. That's interesting. But it's pretty much the same. Q again to get out. So less is pretty much the same. I guess less allows you to use arrows up and down. Depends. On some systems, less and more are exactly the same. On this system, less is uh, has an additional, less is different. It lets you go up and down with the arrow buttons. Now I can also do a, there's also a function called head. Head gives me the first 10 lines of a file. 
So I just want to see like the beginning of it, see what it is. Of course, my file is already less than 10 lines, so it's not going to show you much. But I can give head a number like minus three, and then it'll only give me the first three lines of the file. There's a, similarly, there's a function called tail, which will give me the last three lines of the function. Now again, can, I can think of a way to combine head and tail to get Dafka the third line of the file. Can anybody think of how to do that? You have to use piping to do it. Using pipelining, exactly. Well, I want the third line. So what if I do head minus three on cuckoo? And then tail minus one. Exactly. Then tail minus one, and I'm gonna get exactly the third line, which is hello. Because I said, give me the first three, and then of those first three, give me the last one. So that's the third line. So you see, it's very powerful, very simple programs, head and tail, but all of a sudden I can combine them in ways. This is like uh, to get, get more complicated uh, features to use. Um, I also have a file called, uh, a, a program called file. If I do file on Cuckoo, it's gonna tell me what kind of file it is, an ASCII file. But if I do file, mm -hmm on, let's say, um, bin ls, it doesn't say it's an ASCII file. Well, because it's not an ASCII file. It's, it's in the bin directory. It's probably a binary file. And in fact, it is. And it says like this, dynamically linked, stripped. These are words that tell me that it's a binary file. It's built, it's just telling me what kind of binary file for what processor. It's for a 64-bit x86 processor and it's dynamically linked and it's uh, whatever it is so it tells me this other stuff now if this file is a binary file i don't want to cat it because i can get gibberish but there might be in the file some strings because let's say i write a program called so so if there's a program let's say called hello world that's going to be a long binary file but in there somewhere will be a, a string of hello world that will actually be sitting in the program somewhere. So I might want to just print those printable strings in the file. So I'm going to try that with this program, ls. Strings is a program to give me just the printable characters in the file. So you see, it had some. Strings gave me, now it gave me a lot of stuff. So I'm going to pipe it through my more so that I can go page by page. Notice it says more here at the bottom. If I press space, I'll get more. So these are some of the lines in the, that are actual text in the LS program. You know what I mean? There's a, a line C alloc. Whatever. These are lines that are not um, that are that are that are not binary. A lot of lines here. It's LS is a, it didn't know that LS is a long program. Oh, look, it had something. I can't go up with the up arrows. But if I go less, then I can go down. Mm -hmm. And when I see something interesting, where, oh, I passed it. So I can go up with the up arrows. You see the up arrows will let me go up and the down arrows. Um, so there you see, I did it, I, I, to get out of it, I should be able to do Q. And I, I did strings on this file, and then I did less, because there's a lot of them, I want to see it page by page. So we learned about strings, we learned file, we learned head, tail, more, less, sort, unique, a bunch of stuff. Let's go back, new shit. Wait, did I stop the share? Did you see what I was doing? Yeah, we stopped. Yeah. Yes. Yes, okay. My share is not working the way I want it to. Um, it's giving, okay, here. So, view, present. 
Mm -hmm. So we saw all these things, word count, head, sort, unique, file, strings. We also have more commands. Um, I think L works even on uh, non-ASCII files. Say that again? I didn't tell. It only works on uh, ASCII files or does it work on other things? I wouldn't use it on anything. If you have a file you don't know and you don't, know, I wouldn't use it on anything that's not asking. Uh, it'll do something. Exactly what it might, it might, it might make your display uh, not work properly, you know, temporarily, uh, until you until you make a new terminal. Sometimes it ruins the terminal. But I don't. It, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do it on a binary file. That's why we have the before you view a file that you don't know what it is. Type files on it and see if it's an ASCII file. There are special programs for viewing binary files. Um, the name escapes me right now, but there are. Um, okay, so we have PS, locate, I'll skip, but which, where, date, do, okay, these are some other mm -hmm. things. Let's, let, let's um, show you these things. Okay. So we have PS. PS shows me the processes that I'm running. It shows me that I'm running bash, which is actually the name of the shell that I'm running. And it shows me, interestingly, PS, because when I type PS, I was obviously running the process PS. And that's one of the processes I was running. So right now it's already finished, PS is finished. But for a moment there, at the moment that I typed PS, PS was running. So it showed me two processes running. Bash, which is the shell that I'm in, and the shell that's printed me this line, for example, this prompt, and PS itself. But there must be more things running. So there's a command PSAUX, which shows me uh, processes that I do not own, but that are running. So it shows me that root is the owner of some other processes that are running. Okay, that's PS. Pro it's a useful thing to know what processes are running. Uh, there's also which which, if I do which ls, it'll tell me which ls in my path will get run. In other words, it'll show me the first ls in the path. It'll look for ls in my path. It'll go to all the locations, all the directories in my path and see where ls is. And the first one that it finds, it'll print. On the other hand, if I do where is ls, it'll show me all the ls's that there are. And there's that same one. Well, there's also something in the manual pages in user share man manual one ls.1. So this it'll also show me um, other ls's. That's where it is. There's also a function called date, which shows me the time. It shows me in a certain format. There's flags for date that I can use to change the format of the time it shows. Uh, there's also du minus a. That's my disk usage in, in uh, kilobytes, I think. So 16 kilobytes. I can do du minus here. If it's in, if I say h, h stands for human. Human form means it tells me if it's kilobytes, puts a k there. And if it's megabytes, it puts an m, you know. So that's disk usage. There's also DF, which is disk free, which shows me how much is free space is there or how much empty, how much used space, I should say. Even though it's called disk free, here it's used of it, percent of use. So this is using this much out of this much, that's 74, 72%. But here it's like 0% being used because nothing is being used. This is showing me all the different disks and how much is being used, that's disk free. There's also, on some machines, there's a quota, means a limit of how much disk usage I'm allowed. If I want to know what it is, it'll tell me what it is if I do quota minus V, but quota is not installed, so I can't show you that. There's also something else called wget. wget is very interesting. wget, I can do like this, wget cnn.com. What it does is it goes and fetches for me 
the H index HTML, which is their, their main page of HTML, and I copy it to my home directory or to wherever I am. So I did W get on that. And now if I do LS, I'll see that there's a file called index.html all of a sudden. LS minus L index.html. And I see it's rather large. So I can go around the internet and copy pages from websites, any page I want. You say, well, wait a second, that sounds dangerous. But it's not really, I mean, it sounds like, why do they, you know, what if they don't let you? Well, that's the way the web works. When I go to a page on my browser, I'm essentially copying, I'm essentially copying the page. I'm downloading the page. I'm, the only difference is when I go with there with the browser, I'm not putting it into the onto the disk. Here I copied it to the disk. When is I go doing to a, with, with HTTPS or HTTP. W get looks to me like it's HTTP. I see it. Here, oh, location. I don't know. I don't know. You're asking, is it in, the difference is, is it encrypted or not? Uh, I don't know. But um, you say, what's the difference between this and a browser? Well, a browser also copies the page, but a browser just puts the page into memory, doesn't actually copy it to the disk. Here, I'm copying it to my disk. So it's the same thing. The page is accessible either way. There's also a function called scopy, which is, S, which is well, it's like SSH. There's a, first of all, let me teach you SSH. SSH is also internet-y kind of thing. I can go to a remote site. So I can do, for example, SSH linapp.jct.ac.il, which is a computer at Machon Lev. Oh, I forgot to type SSH. I just write SH here. Now it asks me for Danzig's password. Why does it write Danzig? Because that's what I am over here. And I didn't specify a different username. So if I type my password, and now I'm in the file. I'm in a. I'm in, you know, if I do ls, I see all my files over there at Machon Lev. So. That'll allow, that's already the power of Unix, that I can be in my, on my own computer and then I can jump over to another computer and start accessing files and all these things that I can do over here, I can do over there. Cat, you know, whatever this file, file is over there. In other words, I, once I know how to use Unix and I can get into other machines, I can uh, do whatever I need to do, whatever work I wanna do, I can do anywhere in the world. As long as I have, a, as long as I have a, a an account there. Now there's also here. So Control C, no Control D, exit. Control D, exit. Now I'm back home. Now I can also do S copy. I don't know if this exists here. Yeah, yeah. S copy. Um, and then I can say like cuckoo. And I can copy it to Danzig at linapp.jct.ac.il. Ooh, did that work? I don't think that worked. Maybe I did something wrong. I just did a regular copy. It created a copy of Cuckoo right here. Um, I, what it was supposed to do was copy remotely. Or they did something wrong. What's supposed to happen? Maybe you need to give it a protocol. I need to give it a protocol. I haven't used S copy in a long time. You mean I've tell it, but it's SSH, no? Probably. All right, well, I'm not gonna show you now, but theoretically what it should have done was copied the, the S copy means SSH copy. It means copy it to a remote location, copy this file over to Danzig at linapp.jctacil. That was user Danzig on the machine. Maybe it's not with an at, maybe it's with a colon.
Oh, maybe it's the other way around. See, I just guess. You're allowed to guess. Oh, that worked. I couldn't remember, you know, sometimes I don't remember. There's different, I think there's different versions of S copy. I think 10 years ago, the last time I used S copy, it was the other way. Um, of course, I need a password. And now look, it tells me 100%. It copied all of it over to Cuckoo, over to Danzig.js. Now, if I go into... What? I don't have Cuckoo here. Hmm. That's strange. All right, well, whatever. It was <laughs> maybe something strange going on here. Um, the idea is that it copied it over to, like we saw, it copied it over to that remote location. Theoretically, I should have seen Cuckoo over here. I'll have to look why that didn't work. Um, so we talked about wget. And S copy. Wait, are you seeing? Is my share global in general? It's a global share. Here. Yeah, we're able to see the command. No, no, not the command. The, the, now I'm going back to the slides. So you see the slides now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we did S copy. I didn't do locate because it's not on my machine, but locate is similar to where is. Um, S copy is, well, wget we talked about. Curl is just another version, a little bit more complex, allows a little bit more features, but it's basically the same thing. It you know, does the basic idea of wget. Um, ah, this is the last slide. Okay, so we have diff, kill, Time, last, uptime, you name, now. Okay, so let's look at those. Oh no, that's the wrong thing. Second, let's watch here. And if I do diff, you know, well, let's look at, let's do, for example, cat. Let's do cat cuckoo. Now, if I do, what's the difference between cuckoo and stam? So if you remember, let's see what stam is. Similar, except for the zebra and the apple. So what if I do diff stam cuckoo? It tells me the difference is that zebra and apple. That's the difference between the two files. It also tells me that it starts on line five and ends on line six, something like that. Now, if I switch the order, notice what happens. The arrows are the other way. Because what it's saying is zebra and apple are in cuckoo, but not in stam. Here it's saying zebra and apple are in the right, it's pointing to the right, so it means the right one. <clears throat> now, if I go like this, uh, echo, a little more complicated example, echo um, cat, yeah, cat, like, like, like an animal, into stam. Now, if I do difference, notice what it says. It says cat is in stam, where zebra and apple are in cuckoo. That's the arrows. I can't see the bottom of your terminal for some reason. I see it. You have to hit, click on view options, hit zoom ratio, and set hit fit window. So here you see. So it says, Z, if I, it says zebra and apple are in cuckoo, and cat is in stam. So diff is an interesting program. There's also a, a program called Kill. 
kill sends a message. So if I have a kill sends a signal to a program. So kill minus Tasha to a number, let's say 12. No such process. It tried to find a process 12. There's no process 12. Let's do PS. I see there's a process nine. Um, let's make a process. How can we make a process run? Well, if we type cat and no, we type cat and don't give it anything, cat is running. Cat is running now. It's waiting for me to type something. I could type something and then give it a control D to end it. But if I don't give it a control D, cat is running. So cat is running and I can do control Z, which allows me to get out of it. And I can do, and now if I do PS, I'll see that cat is there. And now I can do like this, kill minus nine, three, seven, nine. That's its process ID number, PID, process ID. And I hit enter. And now I see if I do PS, that there is no cat, it's been killed. If I do a PS again, I won't even see that. So I can, a process that's running, I can have, let's say, an infinite loop that's gotten out of control, and I want to kill it, I can use kill minus nine to kill it. It sends a signal. Uh, what does the minus nine do? The minus nine is which signal to send it. If I do man seven, signal i'm going to get a list of all the signals oh, can we do a break yeah just a minute um oh yeah time we started at five right so yeah let's stop now but i'll just show you nine is signal this is nine signal kill sig kill there's different signals sig kill is signal nine all right, we'll stop here and then we'll have a lab in, uh, let's have a, in a few minutes, let's have a lab, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um.